Hello, I'm Hannah Donnett with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. She enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE EDC Strategies Partnership webinar, which is titled Glyphosate, Review of Animal Carcinogenicity Data and Epigenetic Impacts. Our moderator today is Janan Jensen, Executive Director of Health and the Environment Alliance. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 45 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Janan. Thank you, Hannah, and my warm welcome to everybody online today with us. It's a, I think it's a real pleasure and honor to moderate and to introduce our two speakers today, present their research on a very critical public health issue, exposure to glyphosate and cancer risk. Our first speaker, Professor Dr. Christopher J. Portier, is a semi-retired expert in the design, analysis, and interpretation of environmental health data with a focus on carcinogenicity. Currently, he is a senior collaborating scientist part-time, the Environmental Defense Fund, and an adjunct professor at Emory University and Maastricht University. He's also working with several governments on risk assessment issues and is a consultant on chemical-related issues to several U.S. firms, and that includes glyphosate. Our second speaker, Manon Du Forestel, is a PH student in cancerology and epigenetics at CRCINA, which is the Center for Research in Cancerology Immunology in Nantes, Angers, and this is located in Nantes, France. She is a part of a tumor progression team led by Dr. Francois Vallette. And currently, she's in her second year of her PhD under the supervision of Dr. Pierre-Francois Carton, and she's studying the link between glyphosate and carcinogenesis, always through the prism of epigenetics. I want to thank you both for being with us uh, here today and sharing your research. And with that, I would like to hand now the mic over to Dr. Portier for the first presentation. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seminar. I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, this is just a disclosure page. I'll let you read it, but I'll do a little logistics first. Every one of my slides is numbered, so if you have a question and it pertains to something on a specific slide that you want to see again, if you pay attention to the number in the bottom right corner, you'll be able to look at that. Um, this talk that I'm talking about is from a paper that I've done. It's a very technical paper. It's very dense. It's loaded with a lot of material. I can't cover everything. I'm going to be more than anything telling you how to read the paper uh, rather than taking you through all the findings in the paper. This, this whole process pertains to risk assessment for chemical carcinogens. Uh, the process of doing such a thing is a complicated process and most of it started with Bradford Hill, but it now goes through multiple guidance documents for multiple agencies. It includes policy, it includes process, and it includes science. Today we're talking about the science. And the specific science we'll be talking about is cancer in experimental animals, where you're, you're exposing the animal for a period of time, usually a substantial portion of its lifetime, to multiple doses, uh, multiple groups, with multiple animals in each group. Uh, at the end of the study, you're looking inside of the animals at pathology and other things to see what's going on in the animals and see what of that is causally associated with exposure to the chemical that you've been giving the animals. Um, the, 
this particular set of data deals with the carcinogenicity of glyphosate. Um, going through the literature, going through private regulatory documents, going through everything I could possibly find, I was able to locate 21 total animal carcinogenicity studies that are now publicly available. 13 of these studies had sufficient detail and quality for me to use them in the review. The other eight studies were small, they had other limitations. I, this, I just concluded not to use them. I had a specific rule by which I analyzed the data. Um, in these studies, you look at every single tissue and a variety of different tumors that might appear in those tissues. You get a lot of tissue tumors that are zero, 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 zero. So my data analysis scheme was the individual tumor counts for each study had to be at least three or more tumors when you add up the tumors across all those groups. Less than that, you can't see a significant effect anyway. Um, if I found, if I have multiple studies in the same sex and species and strain, then if I see a, a finding, if I analyze something in one study, regardless of the number of tumors in the other studies, I analyze that as well. Um, <clears throat> And I, I made sure that was at least a significant tumor finding across them. Um, the analysis scheme was to use the Armitage linear trend test in proportions. I'll show you what that is in a minute. Um, I did a pooled analysis using logistic regression when I had multiple studies in the same sex species and strain. And where it was appropriate, I used historical control data sets and analyzed that using Tyrone's test. And I'll talk about that in more detail later. So this is what the results from a typical animal carcinogenicity study might look like when it's presented. This is for one type of tumor, malignant lymphomas. It's from one study, a uh, study by Wood in 2009. This is in male CD1 mice. Um, and what you see is a control and three exposure groups, uh, one, two, three. For each exposure group, there is a Fisher's exact test, that's a comparison between the response at, the, at that group and the response at control. You can see the highest group is significantly different from the control group. This line going through the data is the trend of the data as calculated by the cochrane Armitage linear trend test. And this p-value is the probability that the slope of this line is greater than zero. If the line were zero, then it would be flat across and you'd have no effect. So you're looking to see how significant that is. Across the bottom, you see the actual doses, and then the tumor counts are 0 out of 51, 1 out of 51, 2 out of 51, and 5 out of 51. <clears throat> These are the 13 animal carcinogenicity studies that I identified as having sufficient information and quality to be included in this. I've highlighted one because it's the one I just showed you, the study by Wood et al. from 2019. Um, it's an 18-month study in CD1 mice. There were 51 mice per group. These are the doses. Males and females did not get the same doses in milligrams per kilogram per day. The purity of the glyphosate was 90. And when you look at the data, there were no survival differences or weight differences between the exposure groups. That's very important since then most of the effects can be attributed to the exposure to the chemical. Um, notice that there are 18-month studies in CD1 mice and 24-month studies in CD1 mice. And so there's a difference between the studies, even though they're same sex, species, and strain. And we'll have to look at that as well. So these are the main tables from the paper, although there are tons of supplementary tables. But this summarizes what I found in each study pretty quickly. So across the top here, You've got these A, B, C, D, and E. Those are individual studies. This is in male CD1 mice. The actual studies are listed below it. For example, study D is the one we just looked at, wood, which is right here. Can you see my cursor? Is that correct? I hope so. Um, I've highlighted one tumor here for you to look at, malignant lymphomas. The entries in the tables are the p-values for the slope of the Armitage linear trend test. <clears throat> so for example, here's the wood study. 
0.007, as I showed you before, a highly significant finding. This study see here is from Sujimoto in 1997. It's also significant. This one B here is from Atkinson. It's marginally significant. And this last one right here, A, is from uh, Knizovic and Hogan. And it is not significant at all. The study E, which is uh, Takahashi, had no data for malignant lymphomas, so I didn't include it. Um, the question arises then, uh, I've got two positive studies, one marginal study, one definite negative study. What does this mean? So then I pulled the data and did something like the Armitage linear trend test, but a little more complicated that than that in logistic regression. <coughs> and I can get a p-value for that slope. And in this case, it's 0 0.093, so it's marginally significant. I can also pull the 18-month studies and the 24-month studies separately, which is what I've done here. And you can see for the 24-month studies, it's not statistically significant trend, but for the 18-month studies, it's highly significant trend. I also want to highlight the kidney adenomas and carcinomas for you, just pointing out that it's a highly statistically significant pooled evaluation for the male CD1 mice. This is female CD1 mice. I highlighted malignant lymphomas for you to show you that both the males and the females had malignant lymphomas. This is uh, sprayed dolly rats, male spray dolly rats. I've highlighted two tumors for you, the kidney adenomas, which we also saw in the male mice, and skin keratoacanthomas, which are highly statistically significant in all of the studies except one. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the female spray dolly rats, and there's nothing really extremely interesting in here for the tumors. Um, and this is for male and female with star rats. And you see that I've highlighted skin keratoacanthomas. So now we see the same tumor in spray dolly rail rat males and in um, with star rat males. And there's lots of tumors in here for you to sit down and explore if you'd like to look at them. Um, one has to worry when doing this type of analysis that you're not getting a lot of false positives. If you do 20 statistical tests at 5%, just by chance you'd expect one of them to be positive. Well, you can actually go in and calculate the probability that all of your findings are due to false positive, a type one error. And so I did that here. And that's what this table is showing you. I did a total, grand total of, uh, for example, in mouse, in the male CD1 mice, I did a grand total of 60 statistical tests. That means I expected three to be positive. I actually saw 11 significant findings. The probability of that happening is 0 0.001. So the chances are that all of the, that the chances that all of the findings in the male mouse are false positives is less than one in 10,000. And you can look through this table and see overall, it's a very low probability that all of these are false positives. I also went and looked for supporting evidence in each of these cases. <clears throat> um, so here's an example of supporting evidence. When I look at malignant lymphomas in mice, you remember I saw in CD1 mice a positive findings in both male and female. In Swiss albino mice, where I only had one study, I saw marginal increases in this tumor, the p-value above 0.05, less than 0.1 um, uh, in both males and females. I went look at all the tissues and all the studies that related to lymphomas. We're looking at thymus and lymph nodes and spleens. <coughs> and sporadically, you see dose-related increases in thymus weight, uh, dose-related increases in a number of enlarged lymph nodes, and dose-related increases in the number of enlarged spleens. I also looked at the peer-reviewed literature, and there was a lot of literature there. I've highlighted one here. 
uh, um, transgenic animal that uh, is a model for non Hodgkin's lymphoma in humans. Uh, it has a, a clear response that is related to both malignant lymphomas and NHL. And when this was, when glyphosate was given to these animals in a dose dependent fashion, you saw both a gene dependent and a dose dependent increase in these markers uh, in both short term assays and longer term assays. And finally, in the epidemiology literature, there is an association between NHL and exposure to glyphosate based formulations in humans. Uh, and that is also discussed briefly in the paper. So all told then, one has to make a final sort of subject, subjective uh, conclusion as to how these data um, come out. Some of, the, some of the findings were marginal. Some of them were to me very clear. And so you'll find in the paper, I broke it up into four categories, clear evidence, some evidence, equivocal evidence, and I'm sorry, this didn't convince me. There's no evidence here. And you can look through the table in the paper and see what that looks like. Um, so what do we have? Multiple tumor types in different studies. We have the same tumor in multiple studies. We have rare tumors increased in several different studies. We have tumors in two strains. We have tumors in two species. We have some supporting findings in tissue pathology and, and the peer reviewed literature. <clears throat> My conclusion, glyphosate can clearly cause cancer in rodents. The conclusions of the regulatory agencies were quite different. US EPA concluded none of the tumors evaluated or treatment are related. EFSA concluded no evidence of cancer, carcinogenicity in animals, and IARC working group said sufficient evidence. Why? Why are they different? <clears throat> well, let's talk about why the regulatory agencies excluded positive findings. They argued lack of dose response, a trend test was positive, but not the pairwise comparison, no consistency across studies, difference between sexes, lack of preneoplastic lesions within the range of historic controls and revolts due to a single high dose potentially at or above the NPD. And I've got answers to all of these as to what happens, but I'm going to address three of them very quickly. <clears throat> um, there's something called the power of a statistical test, and that is the probability that if the effect is real, I am able to identify it. <clears throat> so I can do something on my computer, simulation study, that allows me to look at that power. So here, I generated data under the scenario I'm showing you above, which is a 4% background and a 12% background at the high dose. And that gives a power of 52%, which is about normal for an animal bioassay. If I just do the Cochrane's test, if I also require that at least one exposure group be statistically significant compared to the control, then my statistical power drops from 52% to 31%, almost cut in half because of that additional requirement. If, so here we are at that 52% again, the monotonic dose response means that as you increase in dose, the response doesn't drop. This picture here, it drops and then it goes up again. If I do the Cochrane Normative test alone, it's 52% power. If I also require monotonicity, my, my power drops to 24%. I'm less than half as likely to be able to pick it up. Finally, they talk about being in the range of historical controls, which is an improper way to use historical controls. And I just wanted to demonstrate that for you here. So my power is 52%. If I use a historical control data set with five control groups, by using the range of historical controls, my statistical power drops to 49%. If I had 50 historical control data sets, it would drop to 39%. So as I get more and more historical control data, even though it's in agreement with what I'm, what I'm looking at here, my power actually drops. That's because it's the wrong test. And why is it the wrong test? This demonstrates it for that wood example and the malignant lymphomas. Wood in control response, so zero out of 51. The bars here are a frequency histogram 
for the historical data set from Gickness and Clifford in 2005, 31% or eight out of the 26 studies in that database had zero out of 50 in the control group. The high dose group seen for Wood et al. was five out of 51 or roughly 10% response right here. There was one exposure, one control group in Gickness and Clifford, which saw a 13% response. So it's above the highest dose response here. So the agencies kicked that out and said it's not a real response. If you use Tyrone's historical control test, on these data, you get a p-value of 0 0.003. A highly significant finding because the bulk of the control data is down, the, down in the very low response region. So finally, four takeaways. Um, I believe glyphosate causes multiple cancer types to appear in multiple studies in experimental animals. Stop thinking of statistical testing as meaning it's positive, it's negative. Look at the p-value, otherwise you'd lose information. Look at the actual slope. Trend tests are a better tool to use for analyzing these data. A combined analysis is needed if you can, if you can evaluate a tumor in studies using the same sex species and strain, and use historical controls properly in evaluating animal cancer data. And with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Poitier. Great presentation. While we're waiting for Ms. Dubrosto to pull up her slides, I would like to remind you that you can start submitting your questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window. We will begin the Q&A session after Ms. Dubrosto's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Pastel. Feel free to take the mic. Okay. Is it my turn? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the introduction and congratulations to Dr. Portier for the nice talk, obviously. And uh, I'm going to start to uh, present you my study dur uh, performed during the first year of my thesis. I actually am in the second year. And uh, the subject was to um, study how glyphosate can prime mammary cells for tumor regenesis by reprogramming the epigenome. And uh, I was under the supervision of the Dr. Pierre-Francois Carton. So, first of all, uh, a little bit of context. And I will give you, um, I will show you two discoveries which mm. allowed uh, our team to base our hypothesis. The first, uh, in a study by our team published last year by uh, Dr. Brion, one of my colleagues, she's uh, in postdoc now, and she highlighted that another herbicide, which is the Dioron, in combination with the overexpression of a well known oncogene, AKT, participates in the formation of uh, glioblastoma. And secondly, uh, is that we knew glyphosate is able to induce a global DNA hypomethylation, but also that this kind of global hypomethylation uh, promotes breast tumors. So knowing these two things, knowing that we built two hypotheses. The first one, the first question was, is glyphosate carcinogenic by itself? And the second, uh, is glyphosate carcinogenic in combination with another oncogenic hit? And to answer these two questions, uh, throughout the study, uh, you have one model cell line. This is the HMCF10A cells which are immortal, the non-neoplastic, and uh, different molecular and epigenetic tools uh, were used, but uh, I won't go uh, in, into details in their experimentations. So if you have any questions, you can ask them uh, at the end. But briefly, we used QMSRI, HELISA, CHIP, and Xenograft, et cetera, et cetera. So no, we go further in the city. And first, this is the figure A. So it's my experimental protocol. Um, first, I see the cells. I had some chemical compounds, glyphosate, 
control peptide hcRNA in the medium. And at twi uh, the day 21, we analyze the data. And this structure of this experimental protocol will be um, roughly the same in each figure panel. Uh, just another um, detail is that the hub peptide is uh, was developed by uh, my laboratory, by uh, my supervisor, and he's able to um, induce an overall hypermethylation by disruption of a well-known complex, which is DNMT1, UHRF1, and PCNA. So here is my control all along the city. And below, you can see uh, three bar charts. And the first one showed that uh, the methylation level of mcf 10 a DNA collapsed in both the control peptide and the glyphosate condition, meaning that uh, to a lesser extent, glyphosate is responsible for an overall hypomyelination in our model, just had the positive control. And next, the question raised um, is by which molecular mechanism this happened? And the question uh, and the answer, right, sorry, uh, he's in the next two histograms. They outline uh, that glyphosate exposure induces an increase of TET enzyme activity on the figure D, but the, methyl, the maintenance methyl transferase activity remained stable. So then uh, the next step quite, quite logically was to find uh, which TET enzymes are concerned by this activity. And um, from the figure he on the left, you can see um, it is a clear that expression of TET3 soar under glyphosate exposure. And this is not the case for the two other enzymes, TET1 and TET2. Then we performed experiments of uh, RNA interference in order to uh, validate uh, the link between TET3 overexpression and the drop in the methylation level. And uh, as illustrated in the figure half, um, it, is, it is clear that um, in presence of an hcRNA against TET3, the 5MC, so the methylation level of uh, MCF10A DNA, returns to the control level and is much higher than in the hcRNA A negative control condition. So now we can do an intermediate conclusion, if I can say that, and uh, we say that exposure to glyphosate promotes TET3 mediated global DNA hypomethylation in our model. And I try to illustrate it in this graphic abstract so you can follow me um, more simply. You see that glyphosate induced overexpression of TET3 and then the hair will go to global DNA hypomethylation. Next, uh, next figure panel. So uh, here, uh, the experimental protocol is the same except uh, that in the medium, we now had micro RNAs. And uh, that at the end, the cells are injected into mice at the day 21, as you can see. So this is subcutaneously. And um, the micro RNAs were chosen because in uh, the literature, they are associated with poor uh, for notice of um, breast cancer. So you can see the result here in the figure B. So how is shown uh, cells exposed to um, only glyphosate did not cause tumors, unlike the positive control, the herb peptide. But surprisingly, 
there is one situation in which 50% uh, of the mice have developed tumors. Uh, this is when the cells have been exposed to both glyphosate and the mere 182,5B. And at the, in the figure C uh, is the confirmation that tumorogenesis is related to TET3 overexpression because when TET3 is knocked down, he establishes tumor formation. So now uh, you can see the more completed diagram. And uh, so global hypermodulation um, in, uh, in this graph is considered have the first oncogenic heat driving cells further down the road to uh, carcinogenesis. And when the cells encounter a second hit, here it is the overexpression of the mere 182 5B, it leads to neoplasia. Next is the figure three. So um, thanks to the previous uh, experiments, we obtained primoculture uh, of tumors induced by glyphosate exposure. And we compared them to frequently used breast cancer cell lines, MCF7 and MDA, um, MD1. And as is shown in the figure A and B, like MCF7, uh, our cells express the estrogen receptor alpha and have the same sensitivity to uh, tamoxifen. You can see on the figure B. And they also have an, invas an invasion three index comparable to uh, the two other two cell lines, but lower migration speed than the two others. So here, my little conclusion is that cells from the glyphosate-induced breast tumor display characteristics of malignant cells. And um, here we um, are back to uh, the in vivo. And um, this in the next, this panel um, of experiments, we tried to counter the formation of uh, glyphosate-induced tumors by using different chemical agents in the medium of the cell. So it, what I call therapeutic intervention, as you can see in uh, blue green. And uh, this, is what, um, this is what we did. And after injection in a mice, we, uh, have, we obtained those results. So first, uh, folate. So folate is, as you can see on the figure B, uh, a, methylate, a DNA methylating agent. But if you see on the figure uh, C, it does not prevent the development of tumor compared to uh, the control. Conversely, if you uh, check the OSCOBAC side, is uh, an activator of the TET enzyme, all the TET enzymes, which accentuates the demethylating effect of uh, glyphosate and promotes, if you see on the figure C, the appearance of tumors. So ascorbic acid is to avoid. Then uh, more uh, satisfactory results, if I can say, um, the use of a TET inhibitor, which is a DEMOG, limits demethylation, just as for late, but can also abrogate tumor formation, if you see on the figure C. And the use of an antimere uh, also overcome tumor development, but as expected, of course, it has no effect on, uh, on methylation. Here, again, my intermediate conclusion is that uh, DMAG is a TET inhibitor and inhibits tumor formation in uh, the glyphosate challenge cells. And uh, this is the last uh, experiment panel. And in this last experiment, the goal, uh, the objective was to isolate uh, in this 
global hypomyelination, some target uh, T3 genes, allowing to uh, specifically measure the impact of glyphosate and possibly uh, monitor its effects. So uh, briefly, we tried to uh, find a good biomarker. And among the, um, among the several genes referenced in the literature uh, as target of TET3, we selected five that are the most frequently present in TET3 chip hits according to the chip Atlas database. And uh, in our model, we see that uh, among these five genes, two gene loci are both enriched, enriched in TET3 and hypomethylated in the presence of glyphosate. Those genes are MTRNR2HL2 and DUX4. And from the figure B, it is clear that um, the demethylation of these two genes is linked to uh, the TET3 enrichment. This is the same experiment as I previously, I previously described with the cRNA against TET3. And uh, the last thing is uh, this line graph, and uh, it outlines that the specific demethylation of these two genes lasts over time, even when the pressure uh, exerted by glyphosate is lived for one to six weeks. So this is very important because the stability of uh, epigenetic changes is an important factor for a long-term risk determination. Finally, <laughs> my graphic apps right is completed. And we can see that we can say, sorry, that glyphosate exposure induces sustained TET3 mediated gene demethylation. But we don't know um, precisely, molecularly, how the local hypomethylation of DUX4 and MTR are involved in the phenomenon of precancerization. The last slide, uh, the take home message is that in our particular study, glyphosate were not oncogenic by itself, but it acts as a oncogenic heat factor, as a predisposition. And um, in the future, we can say possibly that glyphosate induced methylome reprogramming might be used for the detection of an increased risk for breast cancer in women living in an environment conducive to this type of pollution. So we can say um, farmer women that are at risk. Okay, so I'm done. And uh, of course, some acknowledgement to all my team, all my co-hosters, uh, to um, Hannah and Janon, to uh, all the CHG for the invitation, and for and to all the people that are listening to to us right now. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Deforestel. Uh, now it is time for our Q and A session. You may type in your questions to the Q and A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window. We will get to as many questions as we can. We will follow up on questions we did not get to via email after the after the webinar. I will share Janan's email and you can send her the questions directly. Thank you so much. Janan, do you want to take, take the first? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you both for the very rich presentations and data and just to uh, underscore how relevant and timely this research is for public policy making and regulators, particularly as the EU is going to, uh, the current approval of glyphosate is set to expire in just two years, so at the end of uh, 2022. And last year, um, an application has already been sent for renewal. So 
this will be a space to watch and contribute this research to. And one of the first questions we've had uh, was for Dr. Portier, which relates to this is, what has the response been from EFSA and EPA to your rebuttal of their criticism? What are the opportunities to ensure that your research is presented in their decision-making processes at this point? So I will. So I've, I've received no comments on the paper itself <clears throat> from any of the regulatory authorities. I've I have corresponded with them before about some of these concerns um, and they've made responses, but um, 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 basically haven't changed the way they're doing things, hence the paper, to really challenge them to look at it. Sent to the appropriate regulatory agencies. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Portier. Uh, a second question for you, and then I have a few from Manon. Um, in the studies you present, did the researchers use standard rat chow for the animal feed? and did they test the feed for glyphosate of other toxins? And the question says that normal control groups get food with high levels of glyphosate, GMOs, other toxins, but in the Seralini study, they use clean food for controls and the incident of tumors in these controls was significantly lower. So wondering what the significance of the findings would be if they'd be greater for those that use clean and tested foods. So the Supplemental material for the paper contains the feed for every one of the studies and tells you what it is. None of them are the same. Um, they're all using commercial feed or feed that they prepared themselves and none of them looked at the glyphosate level in the feed. Okay, thank you for that uh, concise answer. And I haven't, uh, we're getting through quite let, a lot of questions, which is let great. Me, yeah, go ahead. Let, let me quickly answer two other questions that are real easy to answer. Uh, all of these studies were feeding studies. None of them were gavage or any other means. Um, and all of them were pure glyphosate. Oh, great. Thank you. Good, you can see the questions. Yes, very. Uh, so then I have a, a question for uh, Manon uh, from Ms. Forestier. Uh, ex would like to explain the physical symptoms present when there is an overexpression of TET3. Is that tumors? So that's one question. Is that clear um, to you? Yeah, I don't know what you mean uh, by physical symptoms. Um, because here we, we worked on a cell line, so we can not, uh, there are no um, um, difference in the aspect of the cells, the form or something. And in the, in the mice, yeah, it was tumors at first. Okay, great. Um, so I have another question. Uh, well, what one uh, a quick is another clarification question was what was the vehicle that glyphosate was dissolved in, and did it influence the ability of cells to take up glyphosate? Okay, so um, uh, I, if I remember well, glyphosate was purchased from Santa Cruz, and uh, the stock uh, solution was prepared in a DMSO. But after glyphosate was diluted uh, directly in a fresh cell culture medium and uh, was fed to the cell at the same point. So um, I think that DMSO was at low dose. So that probably cannot influence, but uh, I cannot say it completely. Uh, I'm, I'm not completely sure you see, you see what I mean, but. I don't think that can influence so much. Okay, thank you. We have lots of questions and we, I think we still have time for one more. Um, um, Hannah, is that okay to ask one more? Yeah, that's great. Great, so uh, this is a question for Dr. Portier and a question uh, is about elaborating on the amount of effort necessary to identify the incidence of cancers for all the various types in the studies you reviewed. And how did this work relate to the reviews done by the government agencies? Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Portier, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't see I'm talking, but... <laughs> Yeah. So the, for the 13 studies that I, I included in the analysis, there are over 18,000 pages in the um, supporting literature from those, from the laboratories. Um, <clears throat> these are not searchable. So you actually have to go through it line by line to pull up the available information. In some cases, it's summarized for you. In some cases, it's not. All told, it probably took me uh, six full working months to uh, pull this out and put it into a form that I could use it for analysis and interpretation. Um, I don't know how much the regulatory agencies did in their own evaluations or not. I can only look at the reports they gave me. They claim to have reviewed the reports. They claim to have done some of their own analysis. I know that EPA did some of its own analysis. EFSA did some analysis, but not all of it. Most of the individual reports used only pairwise comparisons. There was one report that didn't use any statistical tests. Um, very few of them used trend tests. Um, uh, there, it's a lot of work. That's all I can say, a tremendous amount of work. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think we don't have time. We have to have to give the mic back over to Hannah, but um, there are quite a few questions and we can see how we can answer some of them um, with the, the two researchers um, following the call. If you're willing to, a few of them would be great. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Janan, and to Dr. Uh, Portier and Mrs. Duforestel. Thank you very much for your presentations. We will try and get answers to some of these questions. We had quite a few um, that came in today, so thank you for your participation. Um, so we're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Shay's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next webinar will take place tomorrow and is the first Young EDC Scientist Showcase, or YES, webinar in our new ongoing series sponsored by the Healthy Environment and Endocrine Disruptor Strategies Mentoring Working Group and coordinated by CHE. It is titled Exposure to Phthalates and Aging. To learn more and RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website at healthandenvironment.org. Finally, if you had questions, like I mentioned, that we didn't get a chance to get to during the Q&A portion of the webinar, please submit your questions to Jean Jensen at the email listed in our final slide shown here in the web, web, web webinar by May 20th, and we will respond via email as best we can. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Portier and Mr. Forcel, for taking time to present today, and to you, Janan, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day. Stay well and healthy.